Welcome everyone. Thank you very much for taking the time to be here today. To start with, I have some questions for you. Have you ever wondered what is the most natural learning approach? Have you ever wondered how you can instantly grab the attention of your audience? And how you can use deep engagement to teach, convince, and communicate essential lessons. Would you like to learn a technique to instantly entrance your audience, to hold that attention and let people walk away from your talks or lessons with a large portion of your information retained? Well, then you're in the right place and you will learn simple techniques today to accomplish all of that. Today, I will share with you how to design your presentations and speaking engagements using the technique of hypnotic storytelling. Hypnotic storytelling is a way of engaging and staying connected with an audience that elicits curiosity, fascination, and a deep interest in what you have to offer. It is a style of communication that encourages others to abandon habitual thinking and engage in reflective, imaginative, and productive thinking instead. It encourages embracing change by bypassing conscious resistance. And it is a mechanism that enables listeners to retain much, much more information from your sessions, whether the purpose is to teach, to communicate or to persuade. A favorite quote of mine is the man in the arena from a speech of Theodore Roosevelt given in 1910 in Paris, France. And the first part of the quote is, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there's no effort without error and shortcoming. This is a very powerful quote which reminds me of a story I read once on self-belief and persistence. And the story goes as follows. There was a great Japanese warrior who was about to attack the enemy in defense of his village. He had a small army, which was about a tenth of what he needed to repel his enemy. He was confident that he would win, but his men were afraid and doubtful that they would prevail. On the way, he stopped at a shrine and he told his men, After I visit this shrine, I will toss a coin. If it is heads, we will win. If it is tails, we will lose. Destiny holds us in our hand. He entered the shrine and offered a silent prayer. He came out, tossed a coin. It came up heads. His soldiers were then so eager to fight that they won their battle easily. This reminds me of another story, which the late Dr. Milton Erickson, the famed psychiatrist, used to love to tell. He was returning from high school one day when a bridled horse ran past him. The horse, who did not look familiar, was sweating profusely. Sensing the horse was lost, Erickson and some other bystanders cornered the horse. And then rather bravely, he hopped on the horse's back and dug his heels in to get the horse going. Erickson knew that the horse would go in the right direction, even though he didn't know which direction that was. And the horse first headed for the highway, but then started to lose his way when he began heading for a field. And each time the horse would do this, Erickson would simply pull his head around 
and aiming towards the road. And this went on for about four miles or so until finally the horse turned into a local farmyard. The farmer instantly recognized the horse and he asked Ericsson where he'd found him. And Ericsson replied, at our farm down the road. And this is an excellent story that tells us that even if others do not know where we are going, we should. And sometimes we need someone to help us to keep our eyes on what we want to accomplish, just to be reminded where we should end up. And other times, we find the way ourselves. I recently read an article about the top five tips for self-improvement and learning. And according to the author, they were, quality number five, be creative. Creativity is something we all have, but sometimes we lose it when we don't practice it regularly. Quality number four, follow your passion. Passion is what motivates us. If you focus on what motivates you, you have the energy to pursue what matters. Quality number three, learn from failure. Everyone as stories of failure, whether we like to admit it or not. And we can look at failure as something that is negative, or we can look at failure as being a teacher in disguise. When you tell your stories of failure to yourself or to those whom you trust, you will learn from it. These stories are important for us to grow. I have often said, show me the person who has never failed and I will show you a person who has never learned something new. Our ancestors, both ancient and recent, knew the power of using story. They used stories to entertain, to educate and to instill moral values. Grandparents, elders, and parents were always ready to tell little stories to young children as a way to draw their attention and engage with them. And if they were lucky, make them fall asleep. Deeply grounded within folk and fairy tales are the golden threads that teach culture, meaning, and lessons. And as children grow up, those stories change to teach new models of behavior, moral values, and history. And finally, when those children become adults themselves and they have their children, the cycle repeats. Until we started writing down history, storytelling was the library we shared from our memory. Stories allow us to explore the world through our imaginations and to create the meaning we want, or the meaning we want to offer the world. Stories are powerful because of the way the audience interprets it. Stories communicate possibility. It creates new perspectives. It brings imaginative connections, and it engages our creativity, and it illustrates points of learning. As a vehicle for persuasion, Neuroscientists agree that our stories are the single best vehicle we have to transfer our ideas to one another. Stories trigger a release of neurochemicals that force us to pay attention to speakers. It leads us to empathize with them, understand them, and get excited about their ideas. Human beings do not only crave stories, but we also need to hear them. Neuroscientists found that when someone tells a story, the language processing parts in our brain is activated, as well as any other area in our brain that we would use when experiencing the events of the story. For example, if someone tells us about how delicious certain foods are, our sensory cortex lights up. If it is about motion, 
our motor cortex gets activated. A story can put your whole brain to work. And the interesting thing is, is that the brains of the person telling a story and those who are listening to it can synchronize. According to the neuroscientist Yuri Hasson from Princeton, talking about an experiment they executed using brain scans on a storyteller and her audience during a story session. And he said, when the woman spoke English, the volunteers understood her story and their brains synchronized. When she had activity in her insular and emotional brain region, the listeners did too. When her frontal cortex lit up, so did theirs. By simply telling a story, the woman could plant ideas, thoughts, and emotions into the listeners' brains. A story, if broken down into its simplest form, is a connection of cause and effect. And that is exactly how we think. We think in narratives all day long, whether we think about work or our family at home. We make up short stories in our heads for every action and conversation we have or anticipate to have. So when we listen to a story, we create a parallel narrative in our minds to develop meaning that we can understand and embrace in our model of the world. Hypnotic storytelling understands the evolutionary need to relate to the world with narrative, and it utilizes techniques to facilitate the neuro effect of story. At its heart, hypnotic storytelling is a way of telling stories that invites attention and curiosity, while at the same time, it focuses and frames outcomes. It invokes the inner unconscious world and it creates a shared immersive experience that takes us to feelings and emotions. Hypnotic storytelling reaches out to the full awareness and it seeks to seed the unconscious mind with feelings, emotions, and information while keeping our conscious mind engaged. So let's start by discussing the conscious and the unconscious mind. When I talk about the unconscious mind, I am talking about the other than conscious mind which exists outside our immediate rational consciousness. And I'm specifically not using the term in a psychological context. A popular metaphor of the conscious and unconscious mind is that of the iceberg, where the conscious mind is the little that we see above the water, and the unconscious mind is the vast unknown that lies beneath the surface. The conscious mind includes everything that we are aware of in this moment. It is what we see, what we rationalize, and what we process in terms of what is going on now. It is sequential, it's linear, it's intellectual, it seeks analytical and cognitive outcomes from a limited set of information outputs, and it presumes that we can understand problems and by solving those problems, we can eliminate it. Then we get to the unconscious mind. The unconscious mind is a reservoir of all of our experiences, thoughts, urges, and memories. It multitasks, it's intuitive, it connects experiences, connects thoughts, it connects our feelings and our ideas. It transcends time and space and has unlimited focus. And it continuously perceives what is happening around us and it translates feelings and emotions. Our unconscious mind understands everything from a literal basis and will evaluate everything of our experience and what we know to be true. Let's look at the hypnotic cycle. 
what I have here is just a representation of what a hypnotist or a hypnotherapist would do when they are working with one of their clients. And it is essential to understand that hypnosis and trance do not create a loss of self-control. Trance is a very natural state that we all experience many times a day. And simple examples of trance are daydreams, you know, just drifting off, letting your attention go away from the present. For example, like the driving trance, where you potentially will drive through several intersections without consciously noticing whether the lights are green or not. A hypnotic state or a trance happens any time when your attention is focused away from the external reality to some internal memory, thought, imagination, feeling, or emotion. According to Milton Erickson, the renowned psychiatrist who inspired much of neurolinguistic programming's body of work on hypnosis, it is the state in which learning and openness to change is most likely to occur. And if that is true, that is where we want our audience to get to when we are doing a presentation or a talk. On the right side of this slide, you will see there is a representation of the span of consciousness typically experienced in a hypnosis session. There is an induction, which slowly moves the client from conscious awareness to a trance state. In the induction, a skilled hypnotist will use trance deepening techniques to gradually strengthen the trance state with little fluctuations to lift the trance state and then deepen it again. And as paradoxical as that sounds, it causes a much more rapid development of deep trance. And that technique is called fractionation. When the client reaches a deep trance, they enter a state of suggestibility. And this is typically where the hypnotist will do the change work. In traditional hypnotherapy, this will take the form of a suggestion of alternate behavior or eliminating unwanted behavior or adapting existing behavior to achieve some goal or outcome. It may also be suggestion through positive affirmation. Please note that the suggestible state does not mean that a client will do things against their will or against their nature. Once the change work is complete, the hypnotist will gradually then bring the client out of the trance state. This deep trance state is not a permanent one. And should a hypnotist choose not to bring a client out of hypnosis, it will happen naturally. The other indicator that we are interested in in trance is the frequency of the brain waves, and that is measurable by EEG. And depending on the frequency of the brain waves, we can tell whether a client will be in trance or not. I'm just going to explain these from the, the top down. Beta brain waves typically indicates a state in which we are alert and we are capable of active thinking. And that corresponds to a brave wave frequency of around 12 to 27 hertz. In this state, we are capable of active conversation, making decisions, solving problems, focusing on tasks, and learning new concepts. Then we go a little deeper to alpha brain waves. Alpha brain waves indicates a state where we are physically and mentally relaxed. The brainwave frequency at which this occurs is between 8 and 12 hertz. Alpha brainwaves are some of the most easily observed, and they were actually the first brainwaves to be discovered. And they become detectable when the eyes close and the mind relaxes. And they most often occur during activities such as active relaxation techniques like yoga, 
just before you fall asleep or when you are in a state of being creative and artistic. Then we go down to theta brainwaves. And this is a state where we are deeply relaxed. And here we're looking at a frequency band of between three and eight hertz. In this state, we are capable of creativity, insights, dreams, and reduced or altered consciousness. Theta brainwaves typically indicate very deep relaxation, and it occurs more frequently in highly experienced meditation practitioners or in states of hypnosis. Research has also shown a positive association of theta waves with increased memory, creativity, and psychological well being. Most frequently, theta brainwaves are detectable when we are dreaming in our sleep but they also appear during deep meditation or daydreaming. Then we get to delta brainwaves, and this indicates a state where we are asleep and dreaming, and typically this is below 3 hertz. These are the slowest of all brainwaves, and they are strongest when we enjoy restorative sleep in a dreamless state. Now, Delta brainwaves occur at the state that stimulates healing and rejuvenation, which is also why it's crucial to get enough sleep each night. Another brainwave frequency that I've not indicated here is gamma brainwaves. Gamma brainwaves indicate a state of heightened perception, and the frequency at which this occurs is above 27 hertz. It indicates a peak mental state where there's simultaneous processing of information from different parts of the brain. Gamma brainwaves are unusual, and its observation often occurs in long-term meditators like Buddhist monks. In hypnotic storytelling, we aim to get clients to deep beta or shallow theta brainwave states as this is the level at which acceptance and change work becomes comfortable with minimum conscious resistance. Now, in hypnosis, a hypnotherapist will induce relaxation through deepening techniques. In hypnotic storytelling, we create an altered state of consciousness and states of daydreaming through the quality of the stories that we use. Fran Stallings wrote, the unusually deep stillness which can fall upon story listeners appears to be a true altered state of consciousness. The story listening trance. There are many coincidences between the handling of hypnosis and the procedures of storytelling. The kinship between the two arts is striking. That observation probably tells us as much as we want to know about the parallels between hypnosis and storytelling. Let me tell you a story of a man a long time ago in the future. The man sitting on the ground on a piece of cardboard. He wears an old patched jacket and folded in his lap is his white cane. In front of him, next to a small tin cup, there's a sign saying, please help. It is so faded as to be almost impossible to read. And people walk past him, almost as if he is not there. And you can see the resignation on his face and the feelings of helplessness etched there. And you know how it feels when no one is interested 
I'm helping you. Or how it feels to see someone in need you are not in a position to help them. And then suddenly he hears one set of footsteps clicking rapidly and determined on the concrete of the sidewalk coming towards him. And a young woman suddenly kneels, takes his sign, turns it over and writes something on the back and then repositions it in front of him and then walks away as quickly as she approached. And then he hears it, a coin dropping into his tin cup. And then another and another. And the coins keep on coming. The joy, the surprise he feels is immense and gratitude and you can remember how it feels to feel joy and gratitude can you not sometimes it's difficult to imagine how it feels to have lots of nothing and a genuine lack of everything you need not least of which is the acknowledgement of others we all know how it feels to be the new kid, the one who knows no one, the rejected one, whether it's by a friend or a loved one. And getting back to the old man later that afternoon, he hears the familiar sound of rapid steps, similar to that of the young woman who knelt by him earlier. Reaching out, he stops and he asks, did you write on my sign? Yes, she said. What did you write? He says. Something simple, she says. I wrote, it's a beautiful day and I cannot see it. With hypnotic storytelling, we aim to paint imaginary and multi-sensory pictures which direct attention from the external reality to an internally experienced imaginary world. And to create a trance, we often use many different storytelling tools like ambiguous language, the use of altered vocal tones, while at the same time embedding suggestion and metaphors. And in this little story that I just told you, there was some of that, and I will explain it a little bit later. So let's look at some of the tools we can use for hypnotic storytelling. The first and most important tool of hypnotic storytelling is the stories, the metaphors, the lists, or the poems. As an hypnotic storyteller, I'm always looking for stories and metaphors I can use to illustrate specific themes or lessons. Poems work very well as they are vague by design and written as metaphors designed to elicit feelings, emotions, and reflection. Lists are very useful, although they may cause transitions that are too obvious in the opening up of loops. When I talk about lists, it is like when I spoke earlier of the top five, and you are surely familiar with lists like the top 10 or the best three. Then the next question is, what do I mean with loops? And I'll tell you a little anecdote about that. In 1927, the Lithuanian psychologist Bluma Zygarnik observed the effect of interruption on memory processing. While studying at the University of Berlin, her professor, Kurt Lewin, had noted how many waiters in a cafe seemed to remember incomplete tabs more efficiently than those that had been paid for and were complete. 
And this observation appeared to suggest that the mere completion of a task can lead it to being forgotten, while incomplete tasks, like serving a guest at the table who had not yet finished their meal, helped to ensure that the waiter remembered their order. So Igonic decided to test this hypothesis in an experimental setting, and she asked participants to complete a series of separate tasks, such as solving a puzzle or assembling a flat pack box. And around halfway through some of the tasks, participants were interrupted by the experiment supervisor, while for the remaining tasks, they were allowed time to complete them uninterrupted. Following this experiment, Zygonic interviewed each participant asking them to recall details of each task that they had attempted. And her initial findings revealed that participants were able to recall details of interrupted tasks around 90% better than those that they had been able to complete undisturbed. These results suggest that a desire to complete a task can cause it to be retained in a person's memory until it has been completed and that the finality of its completion enables the process of forgetting it to take place. With hypnotic storytelling, we aim to stimulate the zygonic effect, and we want to create curiosity and fixate attention on everything that follows until we close a loop. So how do we do this? And we simply do this by starting to tell the story. And that opens a loop. We don't complete the story. Around halfway through the story or at some appropriate point, we will then switch to something else. So we interrupt the story, we transition, and we might open another story thereby opening another loop. From hypnotic inductions, we know that each subsequent induction takes the client deeper into trance. With hypnotic storytelling, we will open as many loops as is necessary to take the audience into a deep story trance. And then we insert the learning, the suggestions, or the persuasion we want the audience to be aware of. And once that is done, we start closing the loops in reverse order. So the last loop that we opened will be closed first, and then the next to last until we close all the, of the loops all the way to the closing of the first loop or not. Sometimes, we might choose to leave a loop open, which on an unconscious level creates the desire in the audience to go and close that loop for themselves beyond the session. Other tools that we can use to deepen the story trance are utilizing experience and emotion. You may remember me using this on you in the story about the blind beggar. I used the line, and you can remember how it feels to feel joy and gratitude. So in that line, without getting too specific, I am trying to remind you of an experience you've had in your life, whether you recall it consciously or not. And an excellent way to evoke experience is using phrases like, remember a time. So I could say, for example, remember a time when you were really happy. What was that like? And by asking questions after the suggestion, you have to go inside your imagination and inside your memories to retrieve an experience. 
that matches what I'm talking about. And for example, to create states of empathy and emotion, you can use phrases in your stories like, you can feel this, can you not? Or another phrase that's very useful, can you imagine being, and then you complete it with whatever it is that you want to evoke. For example, can you imagine being 10 times more creative than you usually are. And that question, on the one hand, is specific enough to issue you with a great suggestion, but it's also vague enough not to be prescriptive. So, for example, I'm not saying when were you creative. I'm just suggesting that you can be 10 times as creative. Another characteristic of hypnotic stories that helps deepen the story trance is when you bring in vivid descriptions of the senses. By describing the senses, the listener engages with how they experience their senses. And then just one more tool, suggestion. Suggestion is when you give instructions to the listener and they consciously or unconsciously follow it. In the story I told you about the old man begging on the sidewalk, I did a combination of experience elicitation, empathy elicitation, describing the senses and issuing a suggestion to you as a listener. I'll repeat a little piece of that story. In front of him, next to a small tin cup, there is a sign saying, please help. And people walk past him almost as if he is not there. Okay, so what I'm doing there is I'm describing a scene for you. And in a way, you might find yourself creating the scene in your own mind. Without having to answer me directly, what did this old man look like? I talked about his jacket being patched. What color did you envisage that jacket to be? I was talking about the sign that says, please help. In what color was the words written on the cardboard? So let me step the story on and I'm continuing the story. You can see the resignation on his face and the feelings of helplessness each day. So I'm describing what it is that you are seeing. And in a way, you will create for yourself what this expression looks like on his face and how these feelings of helplessness manifest itself on this face in front of you. And then we go further into the story and you know how it feels when no one is interested in helping you. So there's two things that I elicit there. The first thing is the emotion of how it feels, but also the empathy because I'm saying it's you that knows how it feels when no one is interested in helping you. And then continuing the story, or how it feels to see someone in need, but you are not in a position to help them. So there's a combination of the senses and empathy. And then we go further and he hears one set of footsteps clicking rapidly and determined on the concrete of the sidewalk. So they are leaning on the auditory sense. Because how does it sound when someone's walking quickly on concrete, clicking rapidly? And then I'm gonna jump forward in the story and the coins keep on coming. The joy, the surprise he feels is immense. And 
gratitude. And you can remember how it feels to feel joy and gratitude. So there I've done three things in that sentence. And you can remember, suggestion, how it feels, senses, to feel joy and gratitude, emotion. And then we get to the end of the story. And the end of the story says, it's a beautiful day and I cannot see it. And until I got to that part of the story, you may have suspected about what it was that this woman wrote on this piece of cardboard. And this is this specific sentence, it's a beautiful day and I cannot see it. For some of you, that might have been unexpected. And that is something we call a pattern interruption. And a pattern interrupt is meant to disrupt habitual thinking and it's meant to ask the listener to think about the story in a new or a different way. Good, so that's just some of the tools that we utilize when we do hypnotic storytelling. And there are many more. I can spend a couple of hours on other tools like language patterns, like language ambiguity. I will reserve that for another time. Instead, what I want to do is to move on and let's talk briefly about how you would design a session with hypnotic storytelling. What I'll do here is I will also introduce a tool that some of you might already be very familiar with. So the first question that you always want to ask when you start designing a hypnotic storytelling session is the following. What is the one outcome of your session? And notice that I'm saying here, what is the one outcome? Not the two or three or five points that you want to get across, but what is the one thing that your audience must walk away with at the end of this session? And then we can look at what are the three or four points that support that outcome. And what we will do is we will look at those three or four supporting points and we will understand what are the themes they represent. And this, this becomes very important when we start looking at what are the kinds of stories or poems or metaphors that we want to bring into the session. Every story, poem or metaphor that you use in your session should ideally support one of the themes in your session. The tool I want to also introduce here is a tool called Format. And Format is just a very simple tool that allows you to answer four simple questions. The tool is a little bit more complicated than I'm leading you to believe here, but in the way that we use it, it's a very simple approach. And the four questions that we want to answer is, why is this topic important? Most people sitting in a session that you're presenting or a talk that you are giving, that for them, if they don't understand why this talk or session is important to them, they lose interest immediately. So you, you want to hook them with the answer to the why question. Why is this important? The second, the second question is, what am I teaching you? Or what am I trying to convince you of, you of? Or what is the message that I want to give you? And this typically looks at the learnings presented as knowledge. Then we get to the third question, which is how. And typically, this is where we would describe any process or logic that they need to know in order to practice whatever it is that we are sharing with them. 
ideally, once you've explained to them how to do something, you will create an experience that they can learn from. And then beyond that, just a small discussion on what the experience was in actually executing this process or logic um, that you shared with them. And then the last question that we answer is what if? What if is all about what can they now do with this skill, this message, or this knowledge that you've shared with them once they leave the session? Our talk is designed according to this visual. We start off setting the context uh, very much like I did earlier. I welcomed you. I told you a little what. I told you what the session was about. And then I gave you some very compelling reasons why hypnotic storytelling is important. Then I started opening up some stories. And then I got to the message part of it. Now, what I've done with the stories, I've progressively entranced you deeper and deeper into the story trance by giving you an experience of the different stories. And then I got to the central message. And there I reminded you of why hypnotic storytelling is important again. And then I started telling you what hypnotic storytelling is. I started giving you some indications on some of the tools. And at the moment, I'm explaining to you how I will share with you the what if as well. Then the next step is, once you understand what the structure is of your talk, the next step is to then start deciding which of these tools are you going to use and where are you going to use it? Where are you going to use suggestion? Where are you going to use empathy? Where are you going to use emotions? And you focus on selecting your stories and your poems and your metaphor and your lists in such a way that you can gradually deepen the story trance by using any and all of those tools. And then, of course, while you are putting your message together, you will also decide whether you want to further use those tools or techniques within your message itself. And then you simply put all of this together. Let's have a look at a real example. And the real example is our session this evening. I started with this and I started and I gave you the little what. And the little what about what we were going to do tonight was how to design the hypnotic storytelling session. Then we went on to the why. And if you don't remember, this is why hypnotic storytelling is important because it gives you the ability to convince to persuade, and to be memorable. And then I started with a story which I called 0 0.1, which was the quote from Teddy Roosevelt, the man in the arena. And you may or may not recall, I only gave you a part of that quote. And then I started the story of the Japanese warrior. And I sort of transitioned over because I was talking about this quote and I said, this reminds me of a story. So you notice that I was changing the story, but it was okay. And some of you may even have noticed that I didn't finish that story. And what happens there is from a hypnotic perspective is I've induced you into a story trance. And as you started paying attention to what I was saying about Teddy Roosevelt, I changed the story to that of the Japanese warrior. And you might have had an uncomfortable feeling in the back of your mind that said, okay, are we done with the quote or are we going to different? Okay, let's go with the story. And that is what we call, and that's that little, little bump that you see there. That's what we call fractionation. So 
I take you, I'm taking you into the trance. I'm bringing you out a little bit with your conscious mind interrupting you. And then we go deeper. And then I started with the story of the runaway horse. And I transitioned by talking about leadership. About the Japanese warrior who was the leader. And that makes me think of the story of the runaway horse. Okay, same thing happens. You are getting entranced in the story trance around the Japanese warrior. And then I change the topic, becoming a little bit more con conscious. But now you're going deeper very quickly because you've seen this before. And you can just surrender to the story. And then I do the same with the list of the self-improvement tips. And you may or may not have noticed that I only shared three of those with you. And then we got to the core message of this talk, which is the mini why to convince, persuade, and be memorable. So I'm repeating that. And then we went into what, and I explained to you how we, what are all the information you need in order to design the hypnotic storytelling. And I talked about structure. I talked about the hypnotic cycle. Um, I talked about the tools that you could use. And then we talked about how. We've actually talked about how you could consolidate all of this knowledge, use the tools, design your sessions, and we are currently busy with our example. And then right now, even though we didn't get to it in the session yet, but we will now. What can you do with all of this? You can go out there using this structure. You can create really persuasive sessions. I use this identical structure when I used to do sales pitches for software. I use this exact same structure for teaching topics, for running talks like this, or simply explaining techniques to people. And I'm sure there are many other things that you can think of that this pattern will help you explain or sell or convince. As you can see on the right-hand side, before we can end the session, there are a few conclusions that we must finish first. Like, for example, the top five tips for self-improvement. And although you realize by now that I use this as a demonstration of how to use a list to create an open loop, you are probably wondering what the whole list is about. And I shared three already. Quality number five was to be creative. Quality number four was to follow your passion. Quality number three was to learn from failure. And the remaining two are quality number two, be ambitious. Ambition stretches you. And if not misaligned, leads you to create new skills, new ideas, and new ventures that will give you happiness and fulfillment. And then quality number one, find your purpose and do what you love. Too many people are following the purposes of others. And following your direction often takes you home to your purpose. Like the horse from Dr. Milton Erickson's story. When Erickson told the farmer that he found him about four miles from the farm, the farmer, who was astonished, asked, how did you know you should come here? And Erickson replied, I didn't know. The horse knew. All I did was to keep his attention on the road. And the warrior, his soldiers won the battle decisively. And his attendant, after the battle, said to him, no one can change the hand of destiny. And the attendant was worried that his master tempted fate and the spirits of their ancestors. Indeed not, said the warrior, showing him a coin that was double-sided with heads facing either way. Hypnotic storytelling is an excellent tool for anyone who teaches, speaks, or convinces others as a part of their career. 
It allows the storyteller to share information and experiences in a framework that draws the listener in, extends awareness to the senses, and stretches the unconscious mind to engage patterns to learn and retain information efficiently. I would encourage all of you to explore this technique for yourself, practice it, and see what possibility it will open up for you. So thank you very much for showing up and good luck with your personal growth and your leadership and any horses you may encounter.